All right, so I've got music coming from somewhere. Oh, there we go. It's probably it's probably going to overlap. Let's let's fix all this. Oh, we see we always have issues. Hello everyone. <laughs> we're just we're doing it live. <laughs> yeah, right. Um welcome to the to a, to a regular geek cast. One we haven't done in like a year, year and a half, something like that. Um, live here on Twitch, which will be uploaded to YouTube for those of you who aren't here or have to leave at some point. Um, this is a new geek cast, a new format. It's special. You can they not hear you? That's fine. You don't need to talk. It's fine. That's a good call. That's a good call. All right, you should be good now. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so I mean, anyone that can't hear me, that's your problem, not mine. Assistant to the regional manager. See, so I'm not the one in charge. Just blame it on someone else, not me. Yeah, exactly. Um. So, uh, yeah, this is the the a new version of the Geekcast. This is a specific format that uh, I've been super excited about. I've been kind of formulating this for the past several months, and I want to. I wanted to have a nice conversation about where the future's going to lead us. Um, as most of you, I would hope, are in the MSP space, uh, it's, in my experiences here, we've gone from zero to 100 really quick. Um, in my eight years, uh, we've had the backup revolution um, to where everyone went off of tapes. Uh, into the cloud, into on-prem servers, uh, hard drives, uh, into uh, security and automation and Office, migrating everyone from Exchange into Office 365 and all of that. So it's it's and it's it's only picking up speed as the uh, as we progress into the into the world, especially in security is now a huge thing. Um, so we're going to be discussing specific topics that uh, our guest Kelvin uh, has has picked out. Oh, he's on this side. Has picked out um, because uh, I have questions as an MSP user, and I want to educate myself. And I hope that you guys can join us um, in, in in this uh, path as well. So Kelvin, uh, if you if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself to the people who don't know who you are. Uh, yeah, of course. So I'm Kelvin Tegelaar. Um, I'm the uh, I'm a tech blogger at cyberdrain.com. I'm also an MSP owner in the Netherlands. So I'm really focused on uh, everything around MSPs in general. My blog is about helping MSPs achieve more automation with PowerShell and the, with automation in general. Um, my MSP itself is now uh, fairly large. We're, we're, we're gaining critical mass and just growing each month, each day, each year, whatever. But we're fast, we're fast growers and we're trying to remain in control of all of our IT environments. And I'm pretty sure that everyone has, um, everyone that's in the stream right now has the same struggles as we have. No matter where you are in your entire journey, even if it's like um, the, the start of your MSP journey and you're still a solo shop just getting started, or if you're a monster MSP that has 10,000 employees, we're all still struggling with the same things. And, and I think it's a good moment to just talk about the cloud and how it's going to impact us and, and what's all going to happen with the entire future around us. That's great. So. My first experience with the cloud, um, that wasn't like an application that I personally use in a business sense from an MSP standard, was migrating people from Exchange to Office 365. Um, now, as we all know, Office 365 took the world by storm after a few years of everyone hating it. Um, and everything is now moving to the cloud. You have backups, cloud-only backups. You have applications and software businesses run entirely in the cloud. Um, so where do you see the the current setup with the cloud where we are now and where we could potentially head to so yeah we we've sort of been on this bullet train in in the last eight years something like that where microsoft sort of started that evolution of more public cloud for everyone so 
uh, put your exchange servers out of, out of uh, commission and just upload all of that data to the cloud, make sure that Microsoft handles your exchange servers, but also with their IaaS solutions and all that kind of stuff. So I think that we're still on that same bullet train. And finally, there's vendors that are not huge conglomerates like Microsoft, Amazon, that Google, that, that kind of stuff. But there's smaller vendors that are finally getting aboard that train. And I think that's what we're heading towards. The, the, the smaller vendors finally adding value to the cloud by publishing their own stuff in either public clouds or private clouds and making it available. We're not seeing that everywhere yet because I mean, dentistry is still still one of those places where you just can't get out of all of this legacy stuff. But I do think that we're moving so, sort of towards um, the place where each vendor is moving to the cloud and no, no longer it's just for the bigger guys. No, the smaller vendors are also starting to do that. And you're seeing that a lot of in line with business applications, of course. Um, QuickBooks Online is a good example. We don't use QuickBooks here in the Netherlands. We use Exact, which is sort of similar software. But you had a fat client. Now there's a completely online version. So I think that is one of the things that that bullet train is still going, but it's stopping at places and people are getting on faster. Yes. I mean, even like an MSP software, like I don't, I don't, it's been a long time since I've was like, all right, let's install this piece of software so that we can start deploying it to our clients or running it to our clients. It's, it's, it's like the, the noticing myself not having the thought of like, well, what systems does this support that I have to install like a SQL server or an application server? You know, I haven't had that train of thought in a long time. And it's, it's weird to have that, um, you know, just to think about it like that, because I mean, even now when you install a video game or Adobe or whatever, you it pops up and says, hey, here's your system requirements. Do you fit this? And it's it's interesting to know that I can that even the apps I use are all now cloud based. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's not just the applications themselves. It's everything around it. The entire e ecosystem is moving towards this cloud-based infrastructure. And that, that's something that's beautiful to see when you're looking at uh, the work from anywhere, work from home. Uh, with COVID, of course, we started seeing this increase that everyone needed to work from home. Super rapidly. And yeah, it, it was such an acceleration, but all of these vendors just followed suit and were like, hey, maybe we should be offering this in the cloud and not just local. And we should be offering this for multiple workstations. Um, an example is that uh, Adobe, they changed their licensing limits to, hey, you no longer have a maximum of installations per workstation. You simply are able to install the software anywhere and only use it concurrently at one place because it's cloud connected. So that's that just makes it a lot easier for everyone to get into that work from anywhere, any device, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, my brother is a, an architect drafter and he... the. Autodesk is doing the same thing. Like you can install it as wherever you want to, but you have to be logged in. Um, and your login uh, determines your connection to the cloud and that's your license. So your license kind of follows your username uh, around where you go. Um, what are some of the the pitfalls of the currently implemented cloud? Like I know SSO and having a one login for everything, individual app is kind of frustrating personally. Um, what what other pitfalls do you do you see currently in the cloud? Yeah, what what we're seeing, and that's not just for our clients, but for ourselves as well, is that we're moving to the cloud, but we're not changing the way we work. So we're holding on to this legacy way of working, but trying to mold that into the shape of specific applications that we're using, and that that often is a mistake. You, you really have to approach this greenfield. Does our process match, and do we need to change our process? It's 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 a uh, more labor intensive approach, but it also helps a lot in understanding like, hey, are we moving to this simply because we're looking for a tool that gives us the ability to anywhere, or are we looking at this tool because we really want to grow as a company by using this? And that's something that that internally um, we recently changed our RMM systems. And we went to a cloud-based RMM system, and we're actually super happy with that because of that. The the the, the uh, extra time we started thinking about how is our process currently running, and do we need to make any changes there? It's a good moment to just reflect on: Are we still doing things right? 
Yeah, that's 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 definitely a, an interesting approach. Um, that thought didn't even occur to me, uh, in, in in the challenge aspect. So that that's good. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, processes and procedures. I I enjoy that type of uh, surprisingly that type of um, work um, to to make processes and procedures. So um, the the fact that that didn't occur to me is surprising to myself. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, uh, so we know that. Um, evaluating vendors what are some good things to evaluate with new vendors as an msp what do you look for um and like let's say when you were migrating your rmm platform what were some of the key aspects was i'm assuming cloud was one of those when going in looking for it wasn't the first thing we were saying but we did have like this cloud preference but we also really wanted to focus on security. And that's something a lot of MSPs forget during their entire uh, procurement process. They're skipping this, um, this part of the, the process where they're actually getting to know their vendor and starting to discover how is my vendor handling security. For example, in, in our case, we simply sat with the actual uh, the CISO of the company that we moved to. And he explained that to, to us exactly how they do their pen tests and their security. But it wasn't just lip service. It wasn't just talking about it. They actually were like, you know what? Here's some reports from some external pen tests we had. And this is a report from the last security incident we had that we believe was a major incident. And because we had those discussions, I could understand the company were working with a lot better. So I think that in the entire procurement strategy for a new product, whether it be a cloud product or a local product, we really need to talk more with our vendors and really have healthy discussions with them relating to security, because that's, of course, a key concern for any MSP, but really just build that vendor relationship so you can have some trust in them. Uh, I think that's that's pretty important. Awesome. Um, so not to not to stick with the cloud, because we've been here for a while, keep our heads in the yeah. cloud. Um, w- uh, let's move on to another topic that I really enjoy. Um, this, it, it, this kind of led me into uh, my career as an added MSP. Um, the future of automation, um, and I know Microsoft is harping on this really big with uh, Power BI, power, the, the Power Framework. As I, I don't know if they call it that, but that's what I call it because it, it uh, it's Power Power Apps, uh, Intune, Power BI, the entire suite of products. Um, yeah. So what do, you, how do I take advantage of that? That is a brilliant question because right now, I think as an MSP, we're underutilizing our existing tool stack and we're too quick to jump into new stuff like RPA, robotic process automation, uh, power automate and all that kind of stuff. They're RPA tools that they help in assisting with connecting to specific things. Uh, Zapier is also an example of of a platform that's able to do the same stuff. somewhat more limited, but of course, Microsoft does it a lot better. I'm a Microsoft MVP, I have to say that. But yeah, there's um, there's too many MSPs that are quickly grabbing towards this shiny latest new thing. And I think that people need to take a step back in that a little bit. Don't immediately go towards RPA and uh, that kind of automation. Make sure you have your basic skills in order first. And to me, that is make sure your engineers know some PowerShell. Make sure they're they're comfortable with it. Because that understanding of a scripting language can actually help you internally at your MSP or even give some process support to your clients directly. Because you already understand like, hey, script has built up these components. So if I use this in an RPA tool, I need to make sure I have the same components in there. I need to make sure that I'm handling my failures correctly and all that kind of stuff. So I'm thinking that for MSPs themselves, it's very important that they look more towards their basics and the utilization of their existing stack. And that could be the entire ConnectWise suite and how they utilize that. That could be how they utilize separate PowerShell scripts that they execute using another tool like Imibot or whatever. It's just the way they automate is very important. So... Can you give a quick brief overview of what the, aside from Power BI, I'm pretty sure everyone knows what Power BI is. If not, it's a reporting tool and a dashboarding tool, um, which connects can connect via API, SQL, several different methods. Can you give a quick overview for what the other 
power frameworks are like Intune, Power Apps, and Power Automate? Yeah. So um, Power Apps is a way to dynamically and quickly build applications using low code or zero code uh, frameworks. And that means you simply have drag and drop elements and you say like, hey, this button needs to lead to this website or this button needs to perform a specific action in Power Automate. And because it's that simple, it actually offers a lot of power to yourself as um, an IT professional instead of a developer. You're, you're sort of moving into the role of a developer without having to have all that external knowledge that actual developers have. You are, you're able to build specific things that you're um, uh, able to use in your MSP to automate uh, automate stuff. So it's 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 simpler automation, and that's pretty much what it what it amounts to. And separating Power Apps and Power Automate, of course, you also have the Intune, which is more of a workstation automation platform. It is very complementary to your RMM system. It's not a replacement for your RMM because you see a lot of people getting confused about that. Is Intune my replacement for my RMM? It could be potentially in the future, but right now it absolutely isn't. It's it's more of a tool that you're able to use complementary to your RMM to push agents, to look at specific statuses, to um, have a good workstation inventory, all that kind of stuff that your RMM is currently lacking somewhat in because they haven't evolved to uh, the cloud-only infrastructure that people are using these days. So Power Apps, Power Automate are more focusing on low-code, zero-code automation, and Intune is more for your workstation automation. And of course, PowerShell is your constant automation for everything else. Yeah, your direct injection into Microsoft, so is. Um, so you could use Power Apps to build a quick app to either like send it, make a ticket update. Like if you wanted to build your own mini client portal so that someone with a ticket number could log in with their office account or um, another method of login, depending on what's available to set up. And then they could update tickets or review tickets. So that's also an option that you could do, correct? Yeah, yeah absolutely. And because the entire framework is completely integrated in your Microsoft environment, it actually becomes so much simpler to do that. So that that's the benefit of it really. So, uh, I, I, Gavin mentioned this in the chat, um, but, and I, and I agree with this that from what I can see as, as the method of this power framework, um, that we're going to start not actually worrying about what's in our stack and how to integrate and better assist, uh, clients with their stack. Um, because obviously if their web app is in the cloud, if they're cl their business line of business apps in the cloud, their backups are in the cloud, their emails in the cloud, they have local files. That's really about it. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's not too much left. You have financial applications, which again, they're moving to the cloud, not as quickly as some of us would like, and not as good as some of us would like, but they're moving there. Um, so uh, it, what would you agree with that point that we're gonna be as an MSP, probably five to 10 years from now, not in, in the immediate future, because there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, but moving to um, be more supportive in the consulting side to help facilitate things that need to happen with the client's infrastructure versus here's our infrastructure, use it. Yeah, so there's, there's a couple of scenarios that I always play with, but I think that the two things that MSPs will be focusing on is really looking at the process your clients have, and you're already taking a step deeper into professional services there instead of just managed services. You're assisting a client, helping them with their IT, but in a different level. You're really helping them with their line of business process. And then there's the other side where I think that MSPs are really going to shy, and that will have to be user education, because you're not going to be the one that is going to be automating this stuff for them you're going to be the one that is going to explain to them how to use these applications, how to use Power Apps and how to use Power Automate because they are a lot more knowledgeable on how their systems work and how their process works than you are. So you're going to sort of get or introduce them and educate them on the availability of these tools. And that's going to be across the entire stack. 
we're no longer going to be fixing computers because fixing computers is going to be a commodity. Everyone will be able to do that at any time. Replacing a machine is going to be as easy as stepping into the, the, the nearest computer store, buying a new one, starting it up, and you have everything ready and waiting. The biggest challenge for us is going to be pivoting to helping users understand what they're doing. You're going to see that in when they're working cloud only. They'll need to they'll they'll need help in using, for example, Teams or Slack or that kind of stuff. They'll need help in how do I share files with my coworkers? How do I do co-authoring? How do I um, make sure that um, I'm working in the correct documents and, and having the correct flow of um, sending uh, uh, links to attachments instead of actual attachments. And all these small things are going to become a huge user education, user experience thing. And I think that that's what most MSPs are going to be focusing on in the future. It's not necessarily we're going to use Power Apps and Power Automate for you, but we're going to give you the tools to succeed inside of your company because you know the process best. We're going to teach you how to use Power Apps and Power Automate. Okay, so you see it more of a like an educational role as a managed service provider. Yeah, yeah, I'm because I'm wor worried if otherwise you'd enter um, professional services too much, and you'll really have to start sitting in the middle of the companies uh, and understand very deeply how they work, and that that takes a, a different type of engineer and. It already takes a different type of engineer to help people understand how technology works mm -hmm. because you need to be very sociable and you need to have a very um, um, plain language. Uh, you need to make sure that people understand what you're saying. And um, most engineers currently are still way too technical to do that. So there's going to be some rough edges at the start. Absolutely. So let me ask you this as a business process question because the way things are moving, and at least in my opinion, from what I can see, the traditional MSP is going to be outdated and phased out because it's going to be buy a desktop to replace one that's broken or uh, because I'll just log in and all my stuff is available. Um, so the traditional and everything's cloud-based. So you either open a vendor, you be a vendor, vendor liaison or you know, there's going to be very little actual normal MSP work going forward. Um, so, how do you, how would you transition from the model we are today to the the future model? Like, where, how do we position ourselves to take advantage of either that educational model or the professional services model, or both? Um, I think it's going to be somewhat of a natural pivot. I mean, M MSP. 0.1 died already five years ago. Mm -hmm. Most MSPs that only supplied local servers and uh, SBS machines. They're still around. No, you love them, that kind of stuff. Um, yeah, the, 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 those already died out. They, 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 sim they simply didn't um, um, evolve with the times. They didn't introduce cloud-only stuff. They didn't move. And they, they are already gone. The MSP 1.0 are dead. And we're currently at, at, at the phase two and everyone is still trying to find themselves. And I think it's going to be a quite natural evolution of either MSPs moving into professional services and starting that process stuff or helping with educational services, something like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, well, there's plenty of zero to five MSPs around. Um, I don't think anyone's going to debate that point. They are, I, I would put Absolutely. them as being dead because they're not here for the, the long term. And, you know, as, as we evolve in the technology world, everything is going to, you know, just, you know, slowly die out like the, the dinosaurs and, you know, exactly. people still have landline phones for, I mean, like they do? homes. Yes. Really? It's still profitable business. <laughs> I don't know how, <laughs> but they, <laughs> They still do it. Uh, it's it's surprising. So I mean, they'll 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 be some, you know, some some transitional period from from when that from all that happens. Um, let me ask you this: back to kind of in the in the automation realm, how how do you get clients on board with uh, Intune, Power Apps, Power Automate, utilizing that service? Azure Active Directory, because it, it kind of all ties in together. How, how, how do you approach clients with the benefits? Because obviously it's going to cost them more. 
on a monthly basis versus every two years, three years, however. Yeah, I think that's the, that that's the general MSP convinced the, the general MSP has to convince their clients. They have to trust you somewhat, and you just have to tell them that this is the right decision for them. It's we as an MSP force stuff on our clients. We simply say you have no choice. You're going to use these products, and otherwise, you're not going to be our clients. Um, yeah, so that's that that's the biggest thing that we try to do. Uh, it's 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 we enforce it and we make sure that our clients are able to use our products to the fullest so they get uh, the, the most benefit out of these services. That does mean that you have to get client by. You have to convince them somehow. And yes, sometimes it costs more per month, but it also means that the client is able to achieve more value from that. And you have to, you have to, you have to have, sales account manager, sales delivery manager, sales guys, however you want to call them, they have to convince people of that power, of the new tooling, of uh, that kind of stuff. What we often do is, um, especially when we're looking at automating stuff at our client to ease their worries, we try to tell them like, hey guys, um, you're going to be saving potentially this much a month if you are, um, if you are going to use these products to the fullest. And then the client comes back to us with like, okay, how are we going to save that money? And to get more into that professional services part that was just speaking about, like explaining to them how they can use the tooling to automate more and to change their process a little. Yeah. So, I, I mean, for the record, for those who don't know, Kelvin is in the EU. He's not in the US. So those of us who are primarily US based, our clientele is a little different. Um, it's, I haven't met an MSP uh, that we have the ability to go into a client and say, you're doing this. I would love to be able to do that. I would love to have the trust with the client to be able to do that. But there's always that, they always have that in the back of their mind that I'm spending money. I don't want to do this. So it's, we still have to overcome that issue. It's working. We're slowly moving people into the cloud and it's, it's a, it's a progress that we want to do. So. Um, but it is a, a much more difficult thing because we don't always have that same trust or they don't always have that willingness to spend. It's always usually comes down to one of those two things. It's usually the second. Yeah, and I uh, I understand that's a worry. And we had that a lot four years ago, something like four years ago. Four years ago, we decided we're going to force our stack. We're no longer giving clients a choice because we used to accept everything. And that eventually became so wild. it was It was insane. So... As an executive, I said, I don't care if we're losing clients. I don't care if we're going to start bleeding money for the coming months, because what we're doing right now is going to be unprofitable in the long run. We're no longer going to make money on these clients if we keep doing what we're doing. We need to look at how much time we're spending on the client, and we need to make sure that they're profitable for us. And that means our universal stack or nothing else. So we eventually just, just pushed our clients into our standard. And, and it was a long and arduous road. It was a lot of arguments with clients. And we even had to let some of the bigger ones go. We had to say like, okay, you no longer fit our model. And I think that's a decision that as an MSP, you're going to have to make at one point in time. You're going to have to say, we have to apply the standardization or we're going bust. And that, and that's a heavy choice as an MSP. I mean, I've suffered from it myself. I was freaking out about the biggest client ever leaving us. And they came back a couple of months later saying like, hey, you were right. We didn't trust you all the way. And we want to restart our relationship based on trust this time. So please come in, do it right. You have to earn that trust. You have to make sure that, that your entire relationship is based on they trust you to know what's best for them. And, and if your account managers are not able to convey that to the client, then maybe you're just telling the wrong story. Maybe you're not focusing on the relationship and more on, hey, we want to give you these products. Yeah, and I think uh, going back to that, part of the, like you, because you mentioned this yourself, part of the problem is having the owner's buy-in because yeah, absolutely. you didn't come back in to your biggest clients and be like, all right, we're not going to do that. We're going to do this. 
and and circumvent yourself or whoever's saying, hey, we're not going to do that. We're going to, you have to go to this. You have, you have someone who's fully on board and that's it. We're fully on board. Yeah. We're not going to change our opinion. We're not going to change our mind. And that is key because part of trust is being able to tell someone no. I, I, I personally think it's, it's a, it's a huge part because otherwise you're not having two way communication. It's just, I want this. Okay. Well, no, that's not good for your business. That's not good. That's not, that's not where the future's headed. It's, it's a dead end. You need to plan for X, Y, and Z. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, but you got, you got to have that. So if, as an account manager, if you go in and say, Hey, we're going to migrate you to Azure AD and they're like, that costs how much a month? And they go back to the owner or the executive, the CEO, COO, whoever, president, VP, whatever may have you. And they say, Hey, I don't want to really spend this. Why are we doing this? And like, well, don't worry about it. We'll, 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 we'll don't worry about that. So you got to have buy-in from the absolute top and you can't falter yeah. from that decision. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 we also told our account managers, like, as soon as you have someone that doesn't want this or, or is sort of fighting with you on it or, or is upset, have them call us or have us join the meeting as executives. We're going to explain to them that we made this decision as a business because it's best for them. And we, we always were, uh, we, we, we have our companies called Lime Networks. So we always say we're refreshing in IT. And that refreshingness is also, also means you have to be as tra transparent as possible. We simply put on the table like, hey, this is how much money we're spending. And this is how much money we're supposed to spend on your company. And see how big that difference is. We're able to decrease that by a lot. And that means that the margins are better for us, but you're also working better. You're making sure that every one of your employees is able to use their IT to the fullest. That often already convinces people where at the moment that they're seeing we're throwing away money because everyone's con constantly calling the IT department. If you remove that, then, then every company just gets a lot happier and more satisfied with their entire experience at the MSPs. Yeah, I only know of like two people who actually enjoy working the help desk and yeah. they're enigmas. Yeah. Um, all right. So I know we, we kind of covered the future of audit. We, 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 segwayed a bit there towards the end and in the middle, but you know, that's what happens when you discuss stuff like the cloud and automation in the future. Yeah. Um, so aside from my dogs barking, uh, obviously what these new tech, uh, these new tra these new systems coming out, these new, uh, fancy features in tune, you know, the ability with power apps, how do you, how do you get your technicians and your senior level members properly trained? What, what, what's your cycle to get them where they need to go, be? Yeah, so we already have a pretty weird construct at our MSP because we, we have very overqualified people on our service desk. We, have, uh, we always said we have a skilled service desk, but we actually have an overskilled service desk. The guys there are also working on projects, migration, server installations, all that kind of stuff. So our first line support is already very advanced. But that does give us the benefit in the entire company that it's a bunch of geeks together. So when you introduce a new technology and all you have to do to introduce a new technology to a bunch of geeks is by mentioning the name. You just mention the name and people start getting interested and motivated and just want to, want to check out that new technology. So we have a big benefit that we have that very um, specific um, um, user base, employee base, that everyone is already very much into technology. On the account manager side, we offer internal trainings. We have lunch and learn sessions um, each month, actually twice a month lately, but where we introduce a technology to account managers, like, hey, this is going to be the sales price. This is how you're going to be able to sell it. And this is what the product actually does, because we want our account managers to actually see, like, this is how it works in the front end. This is how it works in the back end. And from there on, they'll also be able to make an easier sale because, yeah, they just make a lot more um, connection to the products. Yeah, I've always been of the opinion that anyone in the account management role, because uh, normally you people associate account management with sales and 
and a relationship manager, which is fine. And that is ideally what you want, but they need to have a technical background or a technical understanding because how are they going to build that trust relationship if they don't understand the technology they're working with and selling and providing to the client? Yeah, exactly. They need to be focused on actually knowing how the product works. And if they know that, it just becomes so much easier for them too. And as long as account managers have an easy job, you're making more sales and life is just better. Yeah. Um, so do you do you find, uh, have you found, because obviously it sounds like you're, uh, you've built a niche uh, with your staff, because um, not everyone, unfortunately, shares that same passion. I mean, most of us do. I mean, most of us uh, here present uh, would probably, if you said new fantastic fangled technology, we'd be like, ooh, start just Googling really quickly to start learning as much as we can. Um, but not everyone I'm assuming you've had, uh, employed shares that same, uh, drive and desire. How, how do you overcome that with those individuals? Yeah, that's, that's difficult. Having people that aren't geekish inside of a geekish culture always rubs people the wrong way a little. And then you, you always see some sort of exclusion there. So the, the way we try to get them to get also get that buy-in is by introducing them to the product with a buddy. So we're saying like, hey, sit next to that guy and learn a little bit about the technology. You don't have to know everything. You don't have to know, deep dive on it because not everyone is going to be interested in everything. I mean, we have guys that are super interested in teams. We have other guys saying like, okay, you know what? Screw that. I love Azure and uh, IS solutions and that kind of stuff. So let me focus on that, please. So we try to make sure that um, when we're training our employees, we have that cross-training uh, perspective. So they know a little bit about it, but they don't have to know, they don't have to deep dive on it. So we use a buddy system, teach them a little bit. And from there on, you just, uh, yeah, have a little bit of knowledge. Um, so... When I first be joined the MSP space um, in 2013, seems like it was yesterday, um, the big thing was certs, certificates. Um, you have to get your Microsoft SA. You have to get your database engineer. You have to be a systems administrator. You have to do all this fancy stuff with Microsoft and certs, and they cost hundreds of dollars. And we'll buy them for you, but you have to stay, you know, all this stuff around Microsoft certifications and CCNA and CCNP and all those. Do you, uh, in your current, uh, maybe in the past probably, but do you feel those are valuable to maybe give to your technicians or offer, hey, if you study, we'll pay for it and stuff like that. Do you still do that? Is that still important? Yeah. Absolutely. Um, actually, we recently started a new study program internally where we're saying like, hey, we want multiple people to get their certification. Let's have a trainer come over two days a week, a uh, couple of hours, and make sure that you all get trained in this technology and are able to achieve that certification. So we simply make a little classroom. The people that want to get it sit down. They study with the trainer and actually get the certificate. And th that trainer costs like 400 bucks just for a day and he's able to explain all this stuff they're able to get their certification so it's it's a, it's a minor investment in the entire lifetime of an employee because especially you have to remember your employee shouldn't be with you for one two or three years they should be with you for five ten years most of our employees are so as long as they the, the longer they stay with you the more they can apply that knowledge they taught or they learned in one of those courses I think that that's pretty pretty key about the entire education thing. It's it's very um, a lot of MSPs are saying, oh yeah, that's a paper certificate. Yeah, it could be a paper certificate. It could be, but it could also mean that someone has uh, done a lot of training and has uh, have has actually fol followed some courses and that kind of stuff. So we really try to focus on giving them an educational experience giving them an expert they can talk to and from there on get the certifications. We don't hammer on, you must have these kind of certifications to move on in, in the company because there's a lot of other values that people can bring, but we do like seeing our people certified so we can say, hey, they've actually spent time in a classroom with someone and learned how this technology work, so, or works. So that's, that's 
how we approach it. I know that's not very common in the MSP world because a lot of MSPs still say, here's the book, study it and you'll pass. We don't believe in that. We believe that we have to sort of take responsibility for our employees. There's an almost sort of parental obligation you have towards employees that you have to prepare them for the future, whether that be inside of your company or any other company they work at. Yeah, I mean, that's that it's it's refreshing to hear that because I you know I'd never thought of about hiring a day trainer to come once or twice a week to educate on a specific certification that someone may be interested in. Um, that's actually really you know smart. Um, so kudos. <laughs> um, and uh, so as far as uh, and it's just a, a, a plethora of certifications, right? You go Microsoft, you go networking certs. Yeah, it's it's networking stack. It's it it really depends on what we need at that moment in time, and what we're seeing is uh, something we're evolving towards. So we want people to be prepared, and then most of the time it's Microsoft stuff because well. We're a Microsoft-based MSP. All of our technologies are Microsoft technologies. So a lot of time it's like AZ-104 and, and like the Azure certifications or the Power Platform certifications or Teams. So oftentimes it's that. But just recently we had a trainer come and explain um, this new VoIP platform that we're possibly moving to and then just showing the ropes in that. So yeah, it, it really depends on the moment and what kind of um, resources we require. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 really cool. Um, as far as uh, since we're on the topic of of just stack certs, um, because I know that Microsoft um, generally gives you benefits as a company for registering and being a gold partner, silver partner. You have X amount of certs and whatnot. Is that still a thing? Is it still worth it, aside from the employee being benefited, you know, and making sure that your staff is smart and trained up on all the new technologies and whatnot, uh, is there benefits to the business to have those certs as well? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's in a lot of places, actually. So in the sales process, it's nice to say we're Microsoft certified, but most clients are looking at you like, yeah, congratulations, you're Microsoft certified, you're a gold partner. I'm, um, an, I'm a medical data gold partner. I mean, yeah, it, it really doesn't matter to them what, what, what kind of partnerships you have. What they do want to know is, are your employees experts or are your employees specialists in what they're doing? And that's what we do try to convey to them. Like, hey, they are specialists in what they're doing. For the internal value, yes, absolutely. I mean, having a gold partnership uh, opens up so many possibilities with Microsoft. Um, we're one of the few European or one of the few Dutch partners that has a direct Microsoft uh, account manager that we can talk to about products, about problems, but also about ticket escalations and that kind of stuff. Um, the kickbacks are amazing. Uh, as a Microsoft Gold partner, you get some amazing kickbacks for both the Azure platform and the Office 365 or M365 platform. I think it's up to 22% now if, if you're doing things right. So. The, 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 that kind of stuff is, of course, super valuable to MSPs simply because of the monetary value. I think that for everyone who's doubting to become a silver or gold platform, just make a small calculation on a sheet for you. Like, I'm investing this much, but I'm getting this much in return. You get 100 uh, Microsoft 365 you free licenses now when you're a silver partner or a gold partner. You get uh, $12,000 to spend on Azure any way you see fit. So that that already makes up for any anything that you throw into it. It's it's just sort of free money that they're giving you. So yeah, um, absolutely. It's it's for MSPs. I'd absolutely say focus on those partnerships, but not just Microsoft partnerships. Also look into uh, partnerships with your biggest vendors. If you're working with Dell, try to become a Dell Premier partner. It would help somewhere along the line eventually. That's cool. Um, so this actually segues, segues, segues us perfectly into our next topic that I wanted to that we did, that we're going to discuss. Um, so with training and building up that staff knowledge base, obviously, with the benefits that businesses get, it's monetarily important for businesses to attain silver and gold partnerships. How do you deal with employee burnout? 
That's actually a really good question because having employee burnout is something that we have had extensive experience with as MSPs. I mean, I think we're all well known for our the the, the way we treat employees in MSPs. We're known as as bad, bad culture. It's it's often a lot of toxic places and. Um, Employee retention has always been one of the key key things for us. And I just said it. I don't want employees that are with us for one, two, or three years. I want five years. I want 10 years. I want 15 years. I want employees to be so happy with us that they'll never leave. And that means that you have to focus on mental, mental, the mental well-being of employees, the, the way they are currently uh, feeling. We have uh, a couple of employees in the past that have felt like they were getting close to burning out. And we immediately jump, jumped in on that. We said like, hey, what can we do to make sure that you start feeling more comfortable? Because you have to remember that these are people and these people have made a profit for you over a long period of time. Investing a little bit of money back into their mental health care has enormous returns it it makes everyone happier uh, happier people deliver better work it's as simple as that so you have to focus on the person behind the employee we've seen in the past that to retain employees it takes a lot of effort it takes constant um, conscious decisions you make towards employees we offer a very large range of um secondary benefits and a pretty good salary, primary benefits, that kind of stuff. But it doesn't mean anything if you're not actually taking care of the employee behind all those benefits. And that means really talking to people and actually talking about how they're feeling. And it, it sounds very hippie-ish always to ask someone, how are you really feeling? What, what, are, what emotions are you experiencing? And I, I've always been very much of the technical hard ass stuff you know i've always been more of the um, physical stuff stuff i can touch but i've noticed that if you actually start caring about people they care in return and we try to really tell people like take a mental health day hey i'm seeing that you're making some mistakes take a small extra break go for a walk um stay away for a week we've told people to that, that, that we're stressing about a project where we noticed like hey, these guys are physically suffering from stress. Hey, take a week off. I'm going to take this project over. You have no more worries. And from there, you sort of, it's, it's relationship building. It's the same as how you treat your clients. You should treat your employees even better than that. They, they are the ones making money for you. As management, you have to make sure you're not micromanaging them and take a step back to actually retain your employees I think that I think that's really important, and I could talk about this subject for hours, really, because there's so much stuff that in the past, Lime Networks or I personally, as a manager, as an executive, have done wrong re- regarding this. I've made a lot of mistakes, but I also really want to focus on. I made those mistakes, but I'm never going to make them again with the next employee. I'm never going to make anyone feel uncomfortable. Um, overworked and that kind of stuff again because I personally know what a terrible feeling that is so yeah it's it's uh, reddit has this thing remember the human and like I said it all sounds very hippie-ish but I think that is one of the most important things as an MSP just remember the human your employees are your best resource yeah it can be difficult sometimes to uh, disassociate the client that's yelling in your ear with what with the person in front of you, because obviously you have someone screaming at you as an executive or as an owner or what, you know, as a problem solver. And the person who may be causing the problem is in front of you. <laughs> so it, it can be yeah. easy to redirect that quite, quite uh, simply. And uh, it's, it's employee retention is, is, is an important topic. I mean, I've, I, I've had to deal with, this as well, not currently in my current position, um, but employee management is difficult. It's not easy and it's not an exact science. And each person has their own ways of dealing with stress and dealing with issues. How do you manage accountability as well with all the other things that you need to do? 
Yeah, that's actually having, um, it's a difficult question because like you said, every person has a different approach that they prefer to personally. And I think that's also the way you should uh, do your entire human resources management inside of your company. You have to be careful about the way you allow culture to spread inside of your company. And accountability doesn't have to come from executives. It can be accountability among the, your peers. And that is something that, that, that is important in our company as well. Each peer is able to tell someone else like, hey, you made me feel uncomfortable. Or, hey, you've done this and this caused a problem for me. And that is something that's, that's, I think, for each MSP, something you have to allow. You have to allow people to talk to them. Don't allow people to run to their manager and complain. Because complaining is, in essence, toxic behavior that will just loop through the entire company. If you have one person in a circle that is complaining about something, all the other people in that same circle will also start complaining about something that is bothering them. I'd rather have people talk to the talk to each other directly. And that's, I think, an important part about accountability in MSPs. Make sure that you accept criticism from your peers, but also understand that they have a specific set of emotions that they feel. And what you feel about that doesn't invalidate what they feel. It's, yeah, you have to remember that these people actually have specific things. Yeah, and... Um... Going back to, you know, being able to vent your frustrations to your coworkers, that's, that's very valid and it happens consistently. Like, I mean, I've been a part of groups where we go out to lunch with a couple of guys and we vent and it, you know, client, you know, Hey, oh man, they just would not let me get to their computer. I had to fix six printers and restart the network before they'd even let me get in the door. Like it's, you know, and then you vent about things like oh man they they're lower in the metrics we got to hit the kpi we got to respond quicker you know that's why like it's no one we're not getting that so i i it's a balance between hearing what's happening in those circles of conversation as well as being able to explain what the issues may be because we may be lower in the metrics because we have a lot of customer complaints and we're trying to figure out how to best fix that and, you know, it, it, I was in a situation where I was the guy who displayed the data and management wanted a specific number of metrics. So I put what the, their numbers were and I highlighted what color they were based on if they were close. I got yelled at by the entire engineering team because I was the one explaining. I was put in the position to have to explain why the metrics were being put on the board. And I was fine. I knew what I, I knew that they were specifically complaining about why the metrics were because they weren't properly explained by management. But so I didn't feel any issues with doing what I was doing. But the management who made the decision said nothing. So everyone was venting, which is great. It wasn't handled as it needed to be handled by management. So we got to be careful to draw that, draw the problems out and address them as they need to be addressed. Yeah, and, and that's very, very important. You have to make sure you're not just looping the same thing over and over. You have to really address the problem, make sure it's solved, and then leave it in the past. Because um, in, in, in Dutch, we have the saying, and I'll translate it, but it's, it's one of those things that's nearly untran untranslatable, but it's um, old pain doesn't go away. And that's because people will always remember one of the negative events that happened in the past. Um, 10 years ago, we focused a lot on KPIs about profitability and about um, how many tickets were closed in a specific amount of time and how much time was actually, how much billable time was put out, the, the standard MSP KPIs. But we pushed on that so much that people felt uncomfortable with it. And we stopped that five, six years ago. So we did it 10 years ago. We stopped six years ago. And still some employees are coming to us sometimes. I'm worried about my metrics. And we're like, dude, we told you, we're no longer looking at those numbers. We made a mistake in the past, but it's still something. It's, it's all pain. It doesn't go away just that easy. So you really have to remember that when you address an issue, that should be the end of the issue. It should stop there. And people shouldn't feel the need to bring that up anymore. 
and of course, everyone will bring something up once in a while. Everyone will always feel like, hey, something is still bothering me. I didn't get the closure I wanted. That's always going to happen. But it's it's just you want to promote healthy behavior and not the, the unhealthy, constant um, bringing uh, uh, that old pain back up. Yeah. And you also want to promote because, as we mentioned earlier, each individual is different. So, and each individual is motivated differently. So let's say like me personally, I like money. It's not a huge driving factor in my, where I work. It's an important factor because I have expenses and I have life and I have kids and you know, that's, so it's something I consider, but it's not my driving motivation. Someone else that may be their ultimate motivation is getting as much money as they can for as long as they can. And, and and living with that. Um, so how do you balance that type of retention? Because obviously if it gets out that X is making, I'm the same job as John, John's making twice as much as I am. What? Like that's going to obviously cause friction and issues. How do you, how do you manage that as, as the owner and executive? Yeah. So what we did at our company and I have to say, I'm, I'm, I'm saying we right now and I actually have to exclude myself from that. I have to exclude myself from that because I am the CTO. I'm about strategy. I'm about that kind of stuff. And I have amazing partners that take care of the entire HR part of our company, uh, all the other stuff that isn't directly related to a technical role or to strategy, that kind of stuff. Um, the things that we do are, again, somewhat different from other MSPs, but we, pay, we overpay our, our employees. That's as clear as as clear as day. We simply do that, but we make sure that their salaries are public. They can go to our uh, internal website and say, like, "Hey, this is how much salary you'll make if you have this much experience. If you are working for us this many years, this is the salary you'll make in in your current role, and this is your growth path." And that is the way that you can approach transparency among all your things, all, all your peers. And yeah, sure. Sometimes, for example, we want a very specific guy that has very specific knowledge. We go to that guy and we even pay a little bit extra. And we can tell them we bought him or we're paying him extra for the experience he brought. If you get the same experience, if you get the same uh, level of education, if you get the exact same thing that he does, we'll absolutely discuss your salary. We'll look at what's called in Dutch our salary house and fit you in somewhere else. We'll make sure that you, you're paid on par with your peers. But then you do have to have that exact same experience that the other guy brought in. Because if he brings in 10 years of MSP experience and you bring in five years of in-house IT experience, of course, he is a lot more valuable to us. And we explain that to them as transparent as possible. We also have a grading system. And that grading system was made by our operational director who made this amazing structure on like, hey, you're currently here, and this is the evolution of your current growth path. But you can veer off that growth path whenever you want. If you're saying, I want to get out of the technical role, I want to start doing uh, the VCIO role, or I want to start doing uh, project management, then focus on that. That's absolutely a possibility at Line Networks, as long as you are able to convince us of the worth in that role, of your worth in that role. So that's really interesting. Considering people in chat are, are, <clears throat> are mentioning public salaries, that's just a foreign concept here in the US. So, like, so foreign that it, it's shocking. Um, now, that would definitely alleviate some issues and cause massive issues other ways because here it's not structured like that we have a different structure you you get you negotiate between who's hiring you and yourself so it's it's a negotiation at the end of the day whoever breaks first wins <laughs> like i mean so it's an interesting concept because it'll help not only does it help public but it also helps structure business costs because yeah, you exactly. can plan you know exactly what you're going to pay someone in yeah. the future and uh planning on 
because we have cost of living generally cost of living raises which are should keep with inflation uh aside from bonus raises um so we have cost of living raises but you do you have that in the e eu where it's yeah just... absolutely it's, it's actually uh in most places it's mandatory in the netherlands is it, it isn't but we simply check the inflation rate each year and adjust salaries to that directly so it's completely correlated I that's mean, with the bonus the, or the advanced with structure. their standard growth yeah. we also make sure that we uh correct for inflation because otherwise we're actually discounting our clients it's also the reason why we do yearly um uh, increases of all of our contracts of course we do yearly increases because everything inflation affects everything if we wouldn't do increases we're actually giving our clients a discount same for our employees we would be paying them less for the same service that kind of seems unfair especially if we're raising our prices too and we just make sure everything matches yeah that's um that's it's good business sense to make sure that that happens um because most people don't equate it to most people think um, if you raise prices on clients, they're going to leave, but you're raising it to match inflation. You're not raising it to gouge the client further. Exactly. Exactly. And of course, sometimes we make a little bit of a yeah, correction no and problem. it's a little bit more than inflation. So but, hey, more. that's normal business. I mean, right. we're doing more for you. Um, so what other, have you had any issues with keeping like, so you have this fantastic structure laid out. You're the unicorn MSP, which you already are. Um, how have you had any issues with keeping employees um absolutely that you may have want like you know they left but you wanted to keep them what what are those issues and did you make corrections to see if you could fix that permanently or is it just one of those that they're they're gone we've actually had one lever today um today is actually going to be his last day uh, he's going to uh, be working for a different company that was closer to his home um he would make a little bit more salary there and we even tried to help him. We even tried to help him get that other job because it was such a chance for him. It's not something that we usually do. It's we have a very tight uh, community of employees. And like I said, we have very long serving people with us. And this guy was with us for seven years now, including his internship. Straight out of school, he was hired and he was very fresh. And we sort of made him into a pretty good IT guy. And he's now moving on to a different company. And that's fine because sometimes you need a bit of refreshment. You need a breath of fresh air in the company and making sure that everyone understands what position they're currently in. If you want to start doing something else, absolutely leave for another company. But we do have these exit conversations with these people. And we're not just asking them like, hey, are we uh, not paying you enough? But we ask them questions like, what are the things that annoyed you most about our company? What are the things that you love most about the company? And we have this entire list of sort of a questionnaire and a conversation that we have with the employee just to discover what can we do now to make sure that um, we're not going to lose anyone in the future. And we even told this guy, like, if after a month you don't feel comfortable at the other company, feel free to come on back. We'll hire you again because you were a great employee over the past six, seven years. You've done amazing work. Feel free to come back. Yeah, I mean, that's, again, that's shocking because here in the U.S., it's 100% uh, different. It's the business versus the employee, and it's always that way. Um, it's okay, it's refreshing, and it's not going to change anywhere because I, I'm sure that same dynamic structure is prevalent in the EU and prevalent in the U.K. and prevalent throughout the world because... At the end of the day, I'm trying to get mine. I don't care about you, and I run the business, so it's my decision. You got to, you have to change that philosophy internally to be able to build something like that. Um, do you have anything else you want to say on employee retention? Uh, maybe some good advice or anything before we get into the Q and A. I think that someone just asked um, during the exit interview what we hear is the reason for leaving. Well, this one actually very specifically was that he felt like he would have um, a better chance at the other company for his specific type of growth. We said to him uh, very early on, we see you in a technical role and we're trying to get you out of there and we're trying to help you evolve among your peers to get out of the technical role and more into a management type function. But we just didn't see it happening and didn't have space for him at this moment in time. We didn't have a way of moving him 
towards um, um, a, a different role. We just had no options there. So he said, okay, then I have to start looking for it elsewhere. It was a tough decision for both of us because yeah. we just could make the space. And he, of course, loves, loves our company and wishes he could stay. It's just a natural involvement of people. Yeah, it's... um. When, if an employee enjoys working somewhere, it's, it's always a difficult decision to make to leave. I mean, it's, you mean, you're, it's, you're out of your comfort zone a hundred percent. So, um, do we have any questions like this? We're, we're any questions about any topic you want, uh, the unicorn MSP to my, this side of me. To I, I just want to say, I'm not a unicorn, unicorn MSP. We make mistakes. We oh, yeah. fuck yeah. things up. And, and, and I'm saying that because we seriously did. We've made so many mistakes in the past. I just love talking about our evolution. And that makes it sound like we're this amazing, well-rounded MSP. But we still do things wrong. We still well, approach clients. Doing incorrectly. things wrong. It's, it's not the doing things wrong that's, that's the, the unicornness of your MSP. It's identifying the mistakes, putting in corrections, and making sure they stay stuck. When you make a correction, that's the unicorn yeah. MSP because everywhere else they ignore it. They're after the bottom dollar and they're after the, 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 the exit for yeah. some people. I, I can absolutely, absolutely understand that. Um, I can just say we were very lucky early on in our, in our company they to have, have another executive that was very focused on process and procedure. And because he stamped that into our company so much, we started focusing on that. Yeah. Um, and to answer the the statement to me, um, yeah, you're right. But the problem is the employees don't see it that way because it's, it's employees. It, it, it's not employees versus the business because the employees do have the power, but they're the, the key is employees. It's not employee. I, as an employee have zero authority in my MSP. Now, if all of us together leave, yeah, they're, they're done. But that, that the issue is the multiple. I'm just one person. I can only do so much. And yeah, exactly. at the end of the day, I got a family to feed. So I'm going to do what I can when I can. Um, what is your advice on finding those staff with the right mentality and hiring them? Yeah. Um, if, if someone figures that out, tell me, please. Because right now we're just throwing money at recruiters having a lot of people come visit us, having lots of conversations, trying to find the culture fit, having a lot of assessments, that kind of stuff. So if someone finds a magic book for that, absolutely tell me because, yeah, we're just So here's really, a good question. Yeah. How do money you... at um, recruiters, sorry. No, you're fine. How, are, how, are, how do you identify that right person? What are some, what are some easy methods to identify that person who may be right, I should say, was, instead of, because you never really know until they start working, but to give you some flags, some green flags instead of red flags, that they'd be the right person. Yeah, so one thing we focus on is geekiness. You have to be, uh, again, that entire branding that we have, Live Network's refreshing in IT, you have to be a refreshing geek. So sociable, but still being somewhat of a techie, being able to talk to techies and making sure that, that you are um, able to have two types of conversation. Number one, you are able to have a plain language, simple talk with someone about a piece of technology, and you're about to have that passionate, you're able to have that passionate, deep conversation about an entire framework or something that you find cool about IT, that, that moment that people shine. And that's something we try to get out of, out of people in our um, um, uh, employee interviews, in our new employee interviews, we try to really pull out of them that moment that you see them shine, that, 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 that you see that sparkle in their eyes. If we never see the sparkle, it's, it's something that's vague, and I absolutely understand that, but if we never see the sparkle, we don't think you're a right fit for us because there's that little bit of powerful technology uh, or pow powerful passion about technology that is uh, the thing that uh, is most important for us as a company. We'll understand that eventually you'll have to fit into the culture. You have to grow as a person. You have to get used to people. That all comes over time. But you have to have that passion. So what about things that are on the periphery of IT, like video gaming and modding, which would technically be programming, um, which I could see is you 
see that spark, but like things on the periphery, like photography, um, stuff like that's I that's it. IT is involved in making happen, but isn't necessarily power apps or working on a server or things like that. Do you find that same passion translates yeah, well? Absolutely. Absolutely. As long as they're able to have that geekiness, that that just as long as they're able to really have that spark, yes, it does. It, it doesn't even have to be directly related to IT. It, it could be IT adjacent. Um, I like building robots. I mean, I've built one right here. It's something like that. I don't see any like murder things on that. Uh, you're building a bi really bad battle bot. I mean, this is my beautiful murder bot. It doesn't have a knife or something, so you put it. Like, give it a laser. Come on, it's the future. If we're gonna if we're gonna build like murderous robots, it's got to have murderous cool things like lasers. Exactly. Um. Yeah. So I mean, that, that that was always a question I like to try to ask is what uh in my the interviews that I've done is what passion projects people are interested in and a lot of that's gaming like um not even like normal video games like it used to be like wow world of warcraft was big back in the early 2000s and still big comparatively but some people are into like magic the gathering card games and they have that massive passion for a card and a, and a set of rules and it's just it's interesting because it, it i think personally you can see the the you see that spark that you see, but you also have a more candid conversation because they yeah. feel instead of being uptight and trying to impress you with their posture and their articulation, they're like, did, did you see the, they have the new card decks coming out and they got holographics on the back that they, they just slide foil over it. And they're worth like hundreds of thousands of dollars. And it's just like, you just see that and it, it relaxes them a lot more and you can have a much better conversation yeah, about it. exactly. And that, that's also something that we want. We want to have a conversation during the interview. We don't want you to feel like you're sitting in front of uh, some sort of judges that are trying to gauge exactly uh, how good you are at something. No, we just want to get to know you as a person. And that, that, that's the focus of these interviews. It's who are you as a person and how are you going to, how, how do you do these things? Yeah, because hopefully you um, weeded out those who don't, who may have like, if a recruiter or your ad, you know, sometimes people will apply for a job that they've done before, but they aren't very good at, or they have zero urge to do it. Yeah. Hopefully you exactly. can weed those out pretty quickly in the the conversation, even if you don't necessarily have them in for an interview. Um, as far as employee retention goes, how do you find the remote workforce? Do you find um, your, your staff, do you have like a hybrid setup to where they can come in if they want? How does, how does that role and dynamic work because so obviously we've always we've, we've always wanted people in the office because um because i was an idiot and and covid opened my eyes to that a lot it's i wanted people in the office so i could see them work and it was the most stupid thing i've ever said i i I really, it, that's one of the mistakes, like I said. I, I was always like, hey, if being in the office or not working. And we've now decided that if people want to work 100% remote, feel free to work 100% remote. If you want to work from home two days a week, feel free to do it. Because we've seen people are able to do it and we have to just put our trust in them. And, and I was one of the guys that was against remote work from anywhere, remote work, however you want to call it. But right now I am probably the biggest proponent of it. I'm going to shrink our office simply because people are working from home and I'm going to spend less on office rent. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, I think it's a, a huge benefit. I think a lot of people shared your opinion. It's like, we don't see you. How do I know you're doing stuff? It's it's important to know because you can you can see if someone's doing a good job or not. You can You can gauge, hey, I gave you this task yesterday. It's a five minute task, why is it not done? Um, did you get busy? What did you get caught up on? There's easy indicators to determine someone's ability to complete tasks. Um, it, it's the the work. I mean, in, in today's connected world, there's no like, I got a webcam. I can plug it in and I can talk to my coworkers. Um, yeah. I have a microphone. I can talk to my coworkers. I got a I got a desk phone. My main office is in Maryland and I'm in South Carolina. I can pick that up and call anyone in maryland just extensions it's the the ability now as someone who primarily works from home i enjoy it 
I would like to be able to go into an office. Um, it is nice to have that refreshing, hey, you know, coworker, I, you know, just have that, build that relationship on a one-to-one -one basis because virtual interaction is cool. Physical being there interaction is much better. Um, yes. So it, it's it. And it, it also goes back to that unicorn MSP that you found a problem. Uh, that was a problem and you fixed it. <laughs> Your opinion on remote work from home. Well, if everyone could do that. Um, yeah, yeah, but I think that, um, like I said, it's still early on oh, in yeah. it's it's we're still at a phase where we're still discovering exactly how remote remote work is. And uh, someone just asked in chat, how are you going to do um, uh, remote training? Well, we simply we, we got a couple of employees during COVID, new employees, and we simply set them up with a team room together with a buddy. And they just talked during the day. They solved their tickets. They talked in teams. The other guy picked up the phone and he listened to the conversations that the new employee made. And he was like, hey, just a couple of tips. Don't say this. Do say this. That client likes to be treated this way. And it, it really doesn't matter where people are as long as they're able to do good work. And we have to start sort of start remembering that because work from anywhere is now going to be the biggest thing the biggest business change we're going to have even after COVID. It's going to change mm -hmm. businesses forever. Uh, what was the biggest mistake you've made that's client-facing? And how did you explain it? Yeah, I actually it? wanted to answer this live. I, I even said it in chat. Um, the biggest client-facing mistake is actually um, a clusterfuck of things that, that, that went wrong. One of my employees said, I don't have the knowledge about this specific product. And the client interpreted that as the company does not know how this product works. From there on, things snowballed. And instead of talking with the client, having a good discussion with them and explaining to them how our company works, how our employees work, and that we can't have everyone trained in the exact same things, I started talking at them. I started talking at the clients and telling them, no, you're wrong. And I didn't, I wasn't open to any of their inputs. I wasn't open to any of the uh, defenses that the client had or even worries that the client had. And I think our, the biggest client facing mistake was that I went on the offensive or maybe the defensive and didn't really talk with the client, just at them. And a lot of vendors suffer from the same problems these days. And then I've actually recently on LinkedIn made a post about it that, yeah, remember that you have to talk with people, you're a team, even if you're a client, if it's a client vendor relationship as an MSP and the client, or if it's a vendor MSP relationship, you have to keep talking with people, not at them. Yeah, and that's that's fantastic information. Um, there's been so many times. Uh, also, admit mistakes. That's important. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, it goes a long way to be like, yeah, we we thought we were doing something right. It wasn't. I'm sorry. We've made corrections, and it won't happen again. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's because a lot of times it's just let's let's skirt this under the rug and let's hide this. Let's let's fix it. Let's not tell anyone, but having that, right, that builds trust, that upfront uh, communication and upfront uh, conversations is super important. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's see. There was a couple other good questions. Let me, let me scroll up. Um, while I'm scrolling, feel free to ask. Currently, I have like six windows up. Yeah, I'm not seeing any new questions running in, I think. Does anyone have a funny question they want to ask? Like, what color is my underwear? Just to check out first, hold on. It's black. Ooh, how much workstation setups and user onboards, offboards do you have automated? And how do you manage 100, that? 100%. I can say that 100% of our onboarding and offboarding procedure are automated. And that is because, like we said, we enforce <clears throat> the stack at our clients. And that means that it's much easier for us to automate things end to end. 
And there might be a couple of unique situations in which a client has to be created in a line of business application, but our employees have a only do the work once mentality. So instead of making that user manually in the line of business application, they start figuring out how can we script this and make sure that it's included in the onboarding scripts for that specific client. How can we make sure that it's done automated or at least in some way um, not as labor intensive as it uh, was before? So, so 100% is automated uh, onboarding and offboarding. Is it self-service? <laughs> Um, it is self-service for our internal employees because there's still um, the ways of them to intervene in the process somewhere for whatever reason. There will always be some reason for them to, to get their hands in somewhere. Um, it's not completely self-service <clears throat> for clients, no. All right, so here's a question, uh, and I'm going to segue uh, into the actual question. Um, how do you determine uh, your profitable clients How, what what do you measure to determine a client is profitable and what approach do you take to making sure they are profitable if they're not okay that's actually a really good question because there it's 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 there's always a battle between how do you 100% determine if a client is profitable? You can't just do it based on their managed services contract <clears throat> because if you say, hey, the managed services contract versus the hours, that's a nice number, but you actually want to compare it to all your other clients as well. So we have um, one of our administration and uh, um, service delivery people really focuses on uh, getting the right reporting. And that means how much are we currently making per workstation at a specific client or per user at a specific client, I should say. And that is the number we focus on. That is the number we say like, okay, hey, now we can see if this client is profitable or not because they might still be profitable contract versus hours, but that doesn't mean they're profitable versus another client. And you have to make sure that that balance is always there, that each client gets the same amount of attention, but also is, brings in the same amount of money-ish because it's never going to be an exact science. There, you spend some hours more on one client than the other. But yeah, that, that's something that, uh, that we focus on. So the price per user or the, the profits per user is one of our uh, KPIs on that. So um, we don't have to have specific numbers, but let's say your, your target, let's say your contract says it's $100 per user and your target is also going to be $100 per user. Is that your same no, so the, so So the target is actually often a lot higher than the actual contract per user because you want to spend as less time as possible per workstation or per user. So while you only make 100 per, per workstation, you actually want that amount to be somewhere like 180, 200 range, because you don't want to spend any time on those users. You want that to be zero each month. And sure, during onboarding and the adding new users and this kind of stuff, the profitability might suffer from that a little. But in the long run, or if you look at it over a year or over a year and a half as we do, you want to make sure that that number is as high as possible. You want to make sure you've only spent an hour on a client that has 100 workstations or 100 users. So how do you approach making sure those are fixed? Like, let's say you have a client that's consistently not at your target. What, what steps do you take to fix that? Um, first, we start looking at ourselves. And that is um, something that's very important. We start looking internally. Have we made a mistake with this client? Haven't we implemented our entire stack? Have we uh, maybe uh, promised them something we are not able to do for them? We always look internal first, and then external. There's also another problem, and that is culture fit. Maybe the client just does, doesn't jive with us, with us, and that's why they're calling so much. Maybe they're doing things that are um, um, that, that their workflow is incorrect, and we try to help them fix the workflow the first couple of times. But in the long run, if we can't fix it, we simply fire the client, and that is the measure of any good MSP. The capability of saying, "Client, you're not a good fit for us." Please look for someone someone else. We'll see if uh, we know someone in our uh, 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 circles that can help you. We, we have a lot of other companies that we work closely with. Maybe they're a better fit for you. And that helps in two ways. You remove a profitable or a, a client that might not be as profitable as they should be. You're also helping other MSPs grow, which eventually 
might help you in some way if you have overflow or that, those kind of issues. So how do that I agree with you a hundred percent. Being able to say a client is not a good fit is a huge stepping stone for an MSP. Um, and by huge, I mean, it's like going from your zero dollars to a million dollars. Like that's, it's, it's a massive level of being able to say, all right, look, this just isn't working out. Yeah. What if they're profitable? What if they're your top profitable client? How, how, while I know you're probably what you're probably going to say, how do you approach that being that being your good? Because we obviously some MSPs who are watching um, and maybe viewing this later um, will have either one big client that's providing the majority of their income or, you know, how that may be no longer be a good fit. How, how would you approach that scenario? Well, there's two things that we do. Um, number one is we never allow a client to get above a specific percentage of um, profit for the entire company. If that company is above a specific percentage, we need to get new clients as fast as possible. We need to make sure that, that our sales churn is so high that we don't have a single client that we completely have to rely on because we always want the ability to fire a client even if they're profitable. Even uh, we recently had an example of a client that was profitable, but their uh, the top executive was abusive. He, he shouted at people, he cursed at people. And one time I got him on the phone and I told him, hey, good luck, you'll need to find a new IT provider. Hung up the phone, send him a run book, and it was done. He was a pretty profitable client. They had 50 workstations, beautiful environment, but you do not talk to my employees like that. You have to defend your people. And if your people understand that you're only keeping the clients that you respect in some way or that there's a mutual respect and trust, then, then there's always a good relationship between them too. And from there on, they can start building. Very nice. Um, so to answer the question, um, would you mind explaining how you're set up as far as uh, your staff goes, um, your help yeah, desk, um, and engineers and whatnot. Yeah, so we have um, <clears throat> the, the same tiered model that everyone else has. Um, we have our skilled service desk, which are first line engineers. But in most cases at other MSPs, these would be called um, something like system administrators. They actually perform system administrative tasks. They perform migrations, projects, but they also pick up the phone. We make sure that they don't get tired of picking up the phone by uh, sort of rotating that entire team constantly. Um, as soon as you have that, that the, uh, uh, rotation with people, they actually start enjoying the service desk work more. They start respecting it again a little and they understand that it's a required part of their day-to-day -day routine. You just have a rotation. They don't get bored with constantly answering clients, oh, my mouse is broken. And they are able to work on fun projects too. So yeah, that, that, that's very important. But our tiering model is we have a first line, which really pick up the phone, make tickets, uh, assist clients, that kind of stuff, but also do all those, other, uh, all those other things. Then we have first line specialists. From there on, we have um, the second line team and second line specialists. And those second line specialists are actually the architect level guys. Uh, they uh, create a structured design. Uh, they make sure that automation works properly. They focus on the RMM system. So they, those are more internal technical services employees and the rest are more service delivery employees. So um, we're structured, so I mean, we don't have the rotation. We have a help desk and they're tiered, tier one, tier two, tier three. We have an intake team um, and whose job is to answer phones and input tickets, solve quick issues that can be done, password resets and stuff like that. Um, and then we have a projects team and then we have a uh, sales team and a, uh, we, we, we're also about 52 people as well. Um, we're in the fifties, I think. I don't have the exact counts. Um, we don't have a huge VCIO account management that's our next major goal is to is to get that worked on and fixed and, and moved up um, for now. Uh, you know, there's always things like that. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, any other questions while we're here? Uh, oh, Sondra had a question. Um, how many people do you have working in automation? 
So yeah, um, I've I've already answered that. Um, oh. I am if, yeah, somewhere in chat. I've answered it. I'm not 100 sure I did. I thought I typed it. Well, it officially everyone is responsible for automating, um, but I think eight or ten guys are constantly working on automation are constantly busy with automation in some way um i think we're at five that are primarily their job is to automate um do you outsource any services yeah we use um uptime solutions or inbay um, for 24 7 follow the sun support um, simply because we didn't want to offer that internally i don't want my employees to get called out of bed at Free in the morning because someone's printer in the U.S. isn't working. Um, so our company has done something that I thought was interesting. We actually have employees in India. They're ours. They work for us. They're not outsourced. Um, and they're really great guys. And they cover the overnights. Um, we have two of them now. And it's worked phenomenally. I mean we could evaluate we could hire and do what we need to do like a normal employee but their time zone is different it's um interesting um that that we you know approached it that way that our owner approached it that way i thought that was really smart to to, to cover all the bases um it's it's something that we've considered um but due to european restrictions uh, i mean gdpr and all that kind of stuff it's very difficult for us to hire outside of the european union so it's still stuck in a pretty mm. small time window yeah we don't care about that <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> the us doesn't care <laughs> um what is your smallest customer seat size and your average seat size if you have it wow that is actually a really good question because i have no clue what our smallest customer and what our average is anymore I, if you asked me this one year ago, I would have been able to tell you the exact number, but I've been so much busy with other stuff, uh, buy and build strategy, uh, making sure that the company is going to take their next step, that I am not 100% confident in the numbers I'm able to give. I know our ex smallest client was just a solo shop, um, and that was because it was actually our first client. and. He still is a client, but we just don't let him pay for services anymore. He was our first client, so we we kept him on just because it was possible. And he doesn't pay for services. We help him. And every uh, Christmas, he brings a big cake to the office saying like, hey, guys, good job this year. So it's Yeah, our smallest nice. is one. Um, I think our actual smallest is five users, something like that. Um, that's cool. Um so to answer the question, uh, we don't have that issue. Um, I don't think I, I, I personally don't know of any issues where there were, they don't know one, they don't know that they're in India or in a foreign country. They have a VoIP phone, which has our, which routes through our phone number. So it comes up as a local number or local ish. Um, and they have, if they have an accent, I mean, they, I, I can see the accent, but it's, they, they still speak fine there's no issues i mean we these are our employees so we got to interview them and have a conversation with them just like we normally would with anyone else they just happen to be in india um so uh kevin Kel, Kel, Kev, kevin wow thanks ray thanks ray he did that earlier to me uh and yeah, it just exactly. happened i've been doing good so far uh <laughs> kelvin what are your thoughts on offering DevOps resources to clients who may have a small internal dev team um, we have one client that specializes, um, they're, they're the biggest healthcare data warehouse in the world. And that means that they have a lot of developers locally, internally, all across uh, Europe. They have people that are working to make sure that their products are delivered correctly. Um, we don't offer direct DevOps resources for them, but we do offer them to be heavier on the ops side so they can really focus on dev. And that means that we're more involved with their team than our other clients and we're, we're more involved with their products than their other clients. That's simply because we are the expert when it comes to infrastructure in, and current technology and they are the experts when it comes to actual development. So we take on a lot of more ops responsibility for them. And, and I think that's, that, that is the mode that worked best for us. Would you consider them professional services? 
yeah, I would consider that professional yeah. services. We possible. would as well. I mean, we charge yeah. at the professional, our professional services rate. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's not actually dev. I mean, you'll just have someone who knows how, what dev means and can interact with developers. Yeah. That's really all DevOps is. Exactly. Being able to put PowerShell exactly. stuff together to make things happen. It's, you're not actually programming C code to interact with a hardware infrastructure layer and having to deal with memory retention and garbage collection and stuff like that. So. Yeah, exactly. All right. Um, any other questions? I don't want to keep Kelvin up too late. It is. So 1 a.m. now? One. Yeah, it's 1.30. 1.30? It's okay. Uh, I think the questions are Yeah, done. I think that's I think that's pretty much it. Um All right. Well, I think it's a good time to um wrap it up. I mean, it's it's been a fantastic stream. This has been all I could have hoped for for, for this format goes. I appreciate uh How do you handle support and projects from the same resources? How do you handle support and projects from the same resources? Um, could you clarify that a little, Knaus? Knaus? Uh, Knaus? It, it sounds like you have techs who do support and project work, which, if they're smart enough, they should be able to do both. I don't, I mean, they, yeah. you, you said they rotate, right? Your intake. Yeah, your exactly. They, they're able to do both. Uh, scheduling is done by the service desk uh, coordinator. So they don't mess up with, like, oh, I should have done some ticket at that point in time because the scheduling is just completely done for them. They don't have to worry about it. So yeah, that that that's something that our engineers just pick up internally. Ah, it's pronounced nose. Okay. It's one of those foreign words that have the Yeah, yeah. I actually think that, that is his actual name. I think I've seen him in MSP Geek before. Nice. Um well, yeah, I mean, this I, I appreciate you, Kelvin, for taking the time out of your super busy schedule, um, for one, to answer all these questions and put up with me berating you for uh, almost two hours. And for, uh, you know, consider, especially considering your EU and it's almost 2 a.m. for you. It's okay. <laughs> you're, you're up at all times. Then you're one of the we're, you're one of the few um, who are up randomly in the morning. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It really, it really depends on the day on when I wake up and when I do work. <laughs> um, so, uh, I already have the next iteration of the GeekCast Future Now planned. I don't have a date for it quite yet, but we have the topics and the guest speaker. Um, the goal for these, like I said earlier, is to uh, have executives, owners, uh, senior level technicians to have these type of conversations because. I don't think they're really happening much anywhere, personally. Um, if so, they're not in the circles I venture in. And it's important to get as much information out as possible. It's the, the goal is to educate and to move, bring everyone up to a higher level of skill set and to uh, the understanding. I mean, Kelvin is uh, a unicorn MSP now. He wasn't in the past, but he is now. And it's important to bring everything he's learned to the new MSPs, the future MSPs, uh, and MSPs of his size. Um, our next guest, uh, I'll, I'll save the secret for later, uh, isn't nearly uh, the size of Kelvin, but uh, I'm pretty sure he's got uh, information that not everyone else uh, has the ability to. So um, we're going to be hopefully doing more of these, um, and hopefully this is continuous as you know it continues on the same path that um this one has so again thank you kelvin uh and thank you guys for watching all right no problem